Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Dr. Darrow Preventing Decline podcast. I am very excited to welcome not just one, but two special guests today. I have both Gail Hannon and Sherry Eberts with me. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us. So for those of you that don't know, right, and I'm not I'm not going to read the, the whole bio because I really just want to have a conversation, but both Gail and Sherry are really, if I had to sum it all up, are advocates for people that are living with hearing loss. And, and this is not a small population by any means. In our country alone, in the United States, there's over 50 million people living with hearing loss. Globally, over 500 million. And if you really want to sum it up, It's the number one sensory disorder on the planet. Yet, there's still a lot of stigma. There's still a lot of confusion. There's still a lot of what's and huh. So today, I wanted to bring people who are are living it. I wanted to bring people on here who are advocates for the 500 million people globally. And I really want to start with why, right? You're not alone. You have hearing loss like many other people. But you've decided to really be an advocate for people with hearing loss. And I'll ask both of you. uh, We'll start with Sherry. Why did you decide to do this? Well, thanks again for having us. Um, Really, I was inspired by my children, actually. So my hearing loss is genetic. And I grew up, I first noticed mine when I was in my mid-20s. But I grew up as a child watching my father struggle with his own hearing loss. He was incredibly stigmatized by it and would do almost anything to hide it and really ended up isolating himself from friends, families, co-workers over time. And so when I first discovered my own hearing loss, I sort of followed in his footsteps and retreated Mm -hmm. and was not doing the things that uh, we now talk about in terms of self-advocacy uh, for people living with hearing loss. But once I had children, I saw them watching me do the same things I had watched my father do. And I knew because my hearing loss is genetic, they as adults might develop it as well. And I knew I needed to set a better example. So I sort of did a 180 and started telling everyone about my hearing loss, advocating for myself. And I find the more that I talk about it, um, the more other people are more comfortable with it. And I feel like every time I advocate for myself, I'm advocating for everyone with hearing loss and possibly my children as well. So, Sherry, I I, want to ask, and Gail, I'll come to you in a minute. Sherry, I'm going to say something extremely sarcastic. So I just want to get that out there. This is sarcastic. Okay. I I know that your your dad, right, is from, I'm going to make assumptions about age. Your dad is of the pre-ADA generation, the Americans with Disability Act. And, And if you think back then, unfortunately, the stigmas of, right, deaf and dumb, And these people are to be hidden. They're to be sort of dismissed, put away in schools. They speak weird, right? So there was there was a lot of things were different back then. But supposedly, right, this all changed in 1983 with the Americans with Disability Act. And the reason I said I'm being sarcastic is because it's not as if all of a sudden the light switch went off and everybody came to understand hearing loss. So how is that fighting through that, in spite of the fact that there is the ADA, that there's supposed to be all these accommodations, but I think the reality is that's not the way it actually is. Yeah, well, that that is the the real importance of continued advocacy. So we do sort of have this backstop with the ADA, but in terms of the implementation, it's sometimes challenging. And I think the most important thing really is that hearing loss is so mis understood by the general population. And so people don't take it seriously. Um, It's okay to make fun of it. You know, you would never make fun of somebody bumping into something if they had visual challenges. But if somebody mishears something, that's, you know, the brunt of the joke, right? So it, it is something that we all need to continue to fight for and work for in a positive way. And I think if we advocate for ourselves, it's it becomes sort of this ripple effect where yeah. we interact with people, we teach them a little bit about hearing loss, how they can help, and then they know that. 
and can take it to the next person and the next person. So it really becomes sort of this concentric circle of education. So so it's it's what I hear you saying is, yes, nice backstop. There is the ADA, but that doesn't reduce the need for the continued advocacy. And I love that you continue to do that. Now, Gail, let me ask you, why, why are you doing this? Why are you such a strong advocate for the hearing loss population? Um, I was born with my hearing loss and um, it started off mild and eventually became severe to profound, but it didn't become a, a super thing for me. I mean, I, I or a hearing aid when I could finally get one. But like Sherry, it was my child. I mm. when I was pregnant, um, I went for the well for the first time, oh my gosh, I, I am I'm going to have a baby. And and what if I what if I don't hear him burp? Will he blow up? Mm. Uh what if, you know, how will I hear him crying in the night? No one I knew had those answers. This was in 1995. I was a late bloomer. Um and so I reached out for the first time to other people with hearing loss. And that was life changing. I walked into a conference, one person came out another, knowing I wasn't alone, the stigma fell off my back. And but I also found this was back in the mid 90s, there has to be a better way to talk about hearing loss, um, how uh, we uh, so my passion became helping people realize the impact of hearing loss on their lives. And that what you were talking about with the ADA, which doesn't apply to me because I'm Canadian, um, but it's the, yeah, um, the accommodations may be there or maybe not, but it we have to learn to ask for them. And this is what Sherry and I, the whole thing is, is self-advocacy and learning to live better with your hearing loss. And that became my passion. And that's um, why we teamed up to do what we do. So do, do either of you have the have the million dollar answer of why hearing loss is still so stigmatized? Why it's just not accept? Like you said, I mean, you, you mentioned vision, right? We're not going to laugh at somebody if they're visually impaired and bump into a wall. We're not going to question somebody who wears glasses, but it's like hearing loss is just this, it, you know, I mean, I still scratch my head every day working with patients. Like, why is this such a big deal? I not, do you guys have the answer? Well, I think traditionally, um, historically, uh, you know, people with hearing loss, if we don't have, don't hear, we kind of, you know, we get that look and, and we miss answers. So it, it's always been a, historically was associated with some sort of cognitive or intellectual issue. And um, most of the stigma, no, not most, so much of the stigma is self-stigma. It We perpetuate it. We both know so many people who, it, let's say there's a couple and, and the spouse says, well, I, you know, why I'm trying to convince him or her to get a hearing aid. And it, it, it you know what, it's not a problem. But then that person develops hearing loss and the whole thing starts over it's person by person so it's not that's not really an answer uh keith but it it just uh it's just still evolving in, in the understanding well what I, what i hear you saying gail is 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 it's it's more this internal stigma it's this internal battle that people are struggling with to really accept their medical condition and seek help. It's not that, I mean, right? I, yes, you make a great point. Historically, our society associated this deaf with dumb, which is just horrible, right? Because that's not true at all. There is no, you know, cognitive impairment in somebody who's born with hearing loss. I know plenty of people, as do you, who have become very successful who are born with hearing loss, but it's just, it's a shame. And Sherry, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this stigma and why it's out there. Yeah, I think it's both internal and external, mm -hmm. actually. And, and I, I do think it's because there are these myths around hearing loss. You know, I think that a lot of people equate hearing loss with deafness, and they're two different things. So sometimes when the accommodations are offered to us, they're not necessarily what we need. And so there's sort of this misunderstanding and it continues the stigma. They may say, oh, let's get a sign language interpreter. And for, you know, the 98% of us, 
with hearing issues that don't use sign language, that is not going to be helpful. So I think there's a myth sort of around that. And myths create stigma, right? They create confusion. I think the other myth that's out there are that hearing aids work like glasses. <laughs> and obviously we all know that they don't. Hearing for whatever reason is just a more complicated process to correct um, than vision or some other issues. So I think even when we have our hearing aids, we do need additional help. And so that can be frustrating for people and a stigma arises around that. Well, I mean, you're, you're wearing your hearing aids, why can't you hear me? And so it just becomes, um, you know, it's just misunderstandings, right? Around these myths that continue to perpetuate that stigma. And if I can add something, I think there's also the issue with aging. So people don't, they say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not old enough. I, I can't have hearing loss. I'm not old enough. Or I don't want to wear my hearing aids. People will think I'm old. And I'm like, you are old. You do need it. You know, uh, but there is that aging thing that I don't, you know, so. Oh, I, th I think one. that I think that's such a, an important point you make, which is, and I say this to patients all the time. Look, I understand. And I hear what you're saying, which is you're losing your hearing. Hearing aids might make me look old. But I'm going to level with you because here's something that most of your friends and loved ones won't say to you. Sitting at a table and not interacting, isolating yourself from others. The second you walk out of the room, if you're at a family dinner, they're all talking about how old you look and how worried they are that mom or dad is getting old old and is becoming more frail and is becoming more isolated. So there's actually a lot more, you're actually raising your, uh, you're raising your own red flag when you're not interacting and not part of the conversation. Have you guys sort of come across that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's one of sort of the mind shifts that we really talk about in our book is, you know, we start off saying, well, we don't want to let anyone know about our hearing loss because it's going to make us look old or out of touch. And the real answer is that we should tell everyone about our hearing loss because that's the only way that we are going to create good communication. And we really hope that people will focus not necessarily on hearing better because that may or may not happen. But what we can do is we can communicate better using a lot of the skills that we talk about in Here and Beyond. Well, I think, I think that's a great point to make, right? And that's sort of one of the most important things that I have to you know, sort of convey to my patients, which is what is the actual prognosis? Because it's not, we're not correcting, we're not fixing, we're not curing. We are treating your hearing loss, but you still need to learn how to, and I'm going to steal this from you, you still have to learn how to live skillfully with hearing loss. So tell us, tell me a bit about the book and what brought you two together to say, hey, let's write this book here and beyond. Let's, let's continue our advocacy. What was that journey like? Um, I had written uh, a first book, which was a uh, memoir, um, survival guide, but I knew I wanted to write another book. Uh, all these memoirs were coming out and I, we, there was nothing really available on how to live better with hearing loss. And um, I knew Sherry, I didn't know her very well, but I knew she was interested in writing a book and I would rather write one with her than be in competition with her. Um, <laughs> so I reached out, she went, yes. And um, this was just as the pandemic was coming in. So it was fine for, it was great really. So we spent the pandemic uh, writing this book and created a magic between us and we've become very close and because what we believe is so in line um, to talk about how we can live better with our hearing loss and um, and I'll let Sherry talk a little bit about the fundamentals of, of the book but that's how it started and uh, and that's the that's the the journey that we're on. Yeah please thank you Gail. Sherry share with us Sort of what are the, what are some of the take home messages? What can some right? A lot of people out there living with hearing loss, and and hopefully now they've got the message that there's no cure, there's no quick fix. Yes, you need to treat your hearing loss, but even once you do that, there's still more to it. So give us sort of the synopsis or the take home nuggets from the book here and beyond. 
All right, no pressure. <laughs> go, Sherry, go. <laughs> I, think that, I think there are a number of things in the book, but right. I think one of the things is what we talked about a little bit before, of sort of shifting that focus from hearing better to communicating better. That is huge. And then we have this three-legged stool of skills. And we love the word skills because a skill is something that you can learn to be better at and you can improve. And so we feel like everyone can learn these skills and get better at living with their hearing loss, no matter where they are sort of on that journey. And the three legs are, the first is technology, because obviously having some sort of device is important for most people in terms of treating their hearing loss. But we're really um, very enthusiastic about a wide range of devices. So hearing aids, cochlear implants, but also apps, assistive listening technologies, so many things are out there and always being developed. So it's not just the hearing aid is the silver bullet all types of technology is that first leg. The second is all about attitude. We call it mind shifts. Mm. And so it's really changing our attitudes that we hold about hearing loss and becoming empowered and comfortable advocating for ourselves and asking for the specific assistance that we need. And then the third leg we call communication game changers, which are these behavioral changes. So things like self-identifying, speech reading, um, finding a different seat, all different types of things that are not technology, but can create better communication. Gail, how'd she do? (laughs) She did really, really well. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is, is the thrust of it: is learning how to to manage and and find looking at our hearing loss in a different way, um, and to accepting it and learning how to make partners of the people in our lives because it affects them as well. Partners with um, our loved ones, partners at work. And we really focus uh, a lot on our relationship with the hearing care professional because that is uh, very, very important. And so we talk a lot about that. Um, so, yeah. That, I mean, that that's sort of right. That's the key is your hearing loss impacts everyone around you. And so the way I always think about it is you as the as the patient, you as the person living with this chronic medical condition, you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to, you know, go through the proper diagnostic protocol if recommended, treat your hearing loss, take advantage of whatever technology is needed, apps, assisted listening devices, hearing aids, whatever it may be. But even once you've done all of that, there's still work to be done. There are still skills that need to be acquired. And your family plays a real important role in this. You know, I invite family members to the appointments and they always, a patient will always ask me, well, why? Why does my wife, why does my spouse need to come to the appointment? Does your hearing loss affect them? Is it is it bugging them? Are they pushing you to make this call? And they always say yes. I say, well, that's why they need to be here. They need to understand better your medical condition. And then they need to understand the journey you're about to go on. And I think you guys speak a lot about the journey of living with hearing loss. Gee, Keith, it sounds like you read the book. Um, so I... I <laughs> <laughs> or the synopsis, yeah, uh, but very much so. It's uh, in a, Sherry and I share a lot of our personal experiences and our families and our spouse, and, and it's ongoing. It's not something that happens. Well, okay, okay, honey, you do this, I'll do that. It's ongoing because it's about communication, which is what is the glue that connects us to each other in the world around us. Hearing loss impacts that communication, and the same. Issues keep coming up because hearing people, that you, uh, hearing people only, uh, they hear, they can't help it. That's what they do. So the interaction, is, these little things are always going to come up and we need, we encourage acceptance of that and how to deal with it. Sherry, thoughts? 
Yeah, I think including the family is so critical. Like you said, I always say when you have hearing loss, everyone around you has it as well. And I think sometimes family members, you know, going back to sort of those myths, they don't understand why you have a hearing aid and you're still struggling or Maybe they think that you're not trying hard enough. So I think having them hear about your hearing loss from a professional, from an expert, gives it a little bit more weight and a little more seriousness. And so, you know, they get you get maybe a little bit more buy-in from your family that this is something that you are really trying hard, but it is also a challenge that you are facing. And I think they can provide great information to the provider about some of the the tricks you might already be using, where you struggle the most, and then learn about some of those communication best practices, right? I can tell my children and my husband to face me when they speak to me a million times, but when an expert says it, it just takes on added importance. So there's a great partnership there um, with the provider and including the family. I love that. Yeah, I, I I always have to tell my patients, look, we're going to treat your hearing loss and I'm going to help you hear the best you can. But, but that doesn't mean that it's okay for your spouse to speak to you from the other room while the sink is running and they're doing dishes. Right. That, that's difficult for somebody with normal hearing. So even when we treat your hearing loss, we're never going to get to that point. So the advocacy, it doesn't end. And, and I really... Right. I, I said this before and I want to say it again. Hearing loss, for the most part, is a chronic medical condition. There is no cure. Even treating it doesn't make it go away. Right. So it's going to be there. It really is a lifelong journey. And you have to continue to educate not only yourself as the patient, but your family and friends too. Because after all, my my own 12-year-old said this to me last night while we were reading a book. She said, you know what I learned in school? That the most important thing that helps you live longer is to be happy, right? And we're, we're happy when we're communicating with others, when we are in special relationships with our family and our loved ones. 100%. And I think the other point to make is that it does get easier over time, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about when you develop the skills and you have to practice them and some days are better than others, but it, it, it is something that's going to get better uh, the more that you live it and the more that you continue down that journey. So I want to make sure that we're really sort of sending that positive message because that's why we wrote the book, because we want people to be more comfortable in their skin, be more comfortable with their hearing loss and learn how to live well with it. Um, and I, I think that's all about that skill based approach. And understanding that we have the right to communicate. We have the right to participate. Uh, this is our right, and we can exercise it by engaging everything we've been talking about. We are not lesser than because of our hearing loss. In some ways, we can be more than because we may become better communicators uh, in the process. Tell me about, I want to ask about, uh, you know, your website, livingwithhearingloss.com. Is that a joint venture? Tell me more about that and what people would get from, from going to that website. Well, that's my blog and website. So that um, I started that many years ago and it started off almost sort of as therapy for myself. It was when I was sort of coming out of my hearing loss closet and sort of doing that 180 I was talking about. And I found that writing about it really helped to sort of take some of that stigma away from that I was feeling. And then when I got connected to others, that people would read it and leave comments and say, I felt like that the exact same thing. And this is what I did. And we would generate this conversation. And so it really helped me realize that I wasn't alone with my hearing loss. None of us are. And so I found that peer support, right? People from all around the world um, who are going through the same thing. So it's really um, my outlet for that community. And then, you know, we have a Facebook page and a Facebook group also living with hearing loss. Uh, Sherry, that's so important, right? Because what does hearing loss do to somebody? Isolates them, makes them feel alone. Yet, 
they're not. That's why I always talk about the 50 million people so that, at least in America, I believe the number is closer to 4 million in Canada. So I do know some things about Canada, not much. (laughs) Um, But there's just a lot of people out there and and you're not alone. Now, I know, Gail, you write pretty often for uh, the hearing health and technology matters. So that's where people can find some of your writings. And, And what's your what's your angle there? What's your story in those writings? I'm writing from the um, the point of view of a person living with hearing loss. So all the other writers, except Sherry's an occasional writer as well, are professionals in some aspect of the hearing care profession. So um, I that's you know from the point of view of living with hearing loss, and um, it's been eleven years, uh, twelve years of of writing, and uh, so. so um, I'm starting to plagiarize my own blogs, but uh, <laughs> so many. <laughs> but it's it's a passion that Sherry and I share uh, to keep writing, and the book was an outcome of that. So sure. it's uh, something that I think I'll be doing till I can no longer click on the you know the computer. So what would you say? What is the and, and look? What I really appreciate is not only the advocacy for the people living with hearing loss. But I find this often, and I'm sure you have seen it too, the providers, even though we work with it every day, I think sometimes we can even lose sight, which is why I think it's so cool that there are so many people in hearing healthcare, so many state conferences, manufacturer sponsors that are bringing you guys in as I think a nice reminder of, hey, this is what it's all about. It's not about the widget. It's not about how great you test or fit a hearing aid. It's about the patient. It's about the journey that they're on and how can we play a, a role in helping them communicate and live their best life. 100% agree. And we love to go to those types of conferences and speak and share. And I always learn something. And I think the providers always learn something as well. And one of the big goals that we have with the book, actually, is to get it in front of students and get it into the curriculum, because we feel like the sooner audiology students are exposed to sort of that journey and that real emotion and the real issues around people living with hearing loss, they'll develop their own empathy. And so it'll be much easier for them to practice person-centered care as they begin their their practice. So that's definitely one of the goals that we have for it, the book. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, I, did, uh, I, I could go off on a 30-minute tangent about my gripes with the education of the AUD and hearing specialist programs and how they're not, you know, they just seem to be focusing on the wrong things. Um, but, but I digress, but what is, what is the easiest way for someone to learn about you? What's the easiest way for people to get access to your book? Should they go to your website? Should they go to Amazon? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. there you go. Yes. <laughs> go to um, Amazon, Amazon yeah. and look up here and beyond living skillfully with hearing loss. Go ahead. <laughs> Anywhere books are sold. And so online and bookstores. And we're very excited that the audiobook just dropped this past week. And this morning, I haven't shared it with Sherry. I got a message, uh, and you may have as well, a message from someone who was who bought the audiobook and was listening and was thrilled because she was worried that she wouldn't be able to hear it, everything. But um, our narrator and everything. So it's uh, we're very excited about the the audiobook. Yeah. And Excellent. the book also has a website here and beyond.com. So if people want to learn inf- uh, new information about the book, and then there are links from there to lots of the different platforms where they can. Perfect. Access. Yeah. Cause that's what I know people are going to be interested in reading the book, following you on social media, reading, you know, reading Gail's 12 years of blog and reading the living with hearing loss, reading your story, Shari. Um, I, I really, I can't thank you enough for not only being here, but for sharing your story and for being such amazing and beautiful advocates for people living with hearing loss. Thank you for all that you do and for sharing your time with me today. You're welcome. And thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It's great. Absolutely. Both of you have a great day and please don't stop. 
<laughs> we don't intend to. We don't stop either. <laughs> You're doing <laughs> Excellent. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.